Well, thank you so much, Charlie, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, I'd especially like to thank Ezra for showing up. Uh, Ezra, you've uh, come right into the heart of uh, vegetarianism in Canada, and I uh, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, Ezra, I want to take that even a step further and thank you for being one of the leading speakers on the issue of climate change in our world. Uh, you know, you've done more to raise the issue of climate change than almost anybody that I can think of. Uh, you know, for years, myself and others have been saying, we need to take this issue of climate change out of talking about polar bears and future generations and talk about the impact of these oil companies on real people around the planet today. And Ezra's book uh, has actually done that. So I, I want to thank you for that. Um, now, of course, to a certain extent, I'm joking. Uh, because as probably most of you know, Ezra Levant uh, is a climate change skeptic. Um, now, I, I think that that is a fundamentally unethical position. And the reason I bring forward uh, you know, this sort of joke as an opening is because I think to a certain extent, we need to look at Ezra's book um, in that light. I don't think it's something that should be taken seriously. Um, you know, if, if we're serious about ethics, uh, if we're really serious about it, even if you're skeptical of climate change, would not the ethical position to be precautionary, to, to try to make sure that the impacts that could be felt are not going to be felt, that the impacts that already are being felt by many people do not get significantly worse? To me, the ethical position, uh, if we're really serious about at least looking at the climate change issue, uh, would be to, to be precautionary, not to be going full steam ahead to try to ramp up development. Now, I think this is kind of like being the guy at the bar who doesn't think, you know, drinking is affecting him. Uh, I think uh, Ezra, to a certain extent, is kind of playing the role of the guy who's had a few too many drinks, thinks he can drive home, and not only does he think his friends can too, but he encourages them to have three more drinks before they get him behind the wheel. So, the question really is, why did Ezra write this book? And frankly, I think uh, the answer is Ezra Levant is a hitman for, free, for a free market movement. Uh, ever since Ezra was 24 years old, uh, Ezra, you know, was was brought into much the much earlier than that, Ben. Much earlier oh, than that. Sorry, it's opening statement. But uh, the, this book, Youthquake, which you probably can't see, but I got it here, uh, was was written by Ezra when he was 24, uh, and it was written for the Fraser Institute, where he talked about dismantling the Canadian healthcare system, uh, getting rid of public pensions, basically cutting the social safety net entirely. Yeah. I feel the same way about it, but. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to see Ezra in that light. It's not that I think he's taken money directly from Exxon or from Enron or those kind of guys, uh, but I do think that they're playing for the same team. Um, you know, and, and really there's an irony here, because at the end of the day, I feel like Ezra's really defending the horse and buggy. Uh, he's basically being a protectionist for the old economy and getting in the way of what is actually the pro-business position, which is supporting the new economy that must emerge if we're going to actually face these challenges. And, and why are they doing this? Well, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, the big oil companies, but really all of us worldwide, are kind of like a, an alcoholic who's so addicted to drinking that they're, uh, they've are they run out of alcohol and now they're drinking cough syrup and anything else they can find to try to get their fix. Uh, and that's really what the oil sands is. It's that last bit of oil that we can find anywhere on the planet. Uh, that deep, crude stuff that's, you know, so far underground that we have to upgrade it before we can even process it. Um, you know, a good friend of mine once said, the only choice we really have on this planet is whether we can make a graceful transition or not. Really what we're talking about is trajectories. Uh, now, Ezra will probably say at some point, you know, if not oil from Canada, then from where? From Saudi Arabia, from somewhere else. And, and my, my answer to that is, you know, I'm not talking about what's happening tomorrow. I'm not talking about where you're buying your gasoline tomorrow. Really what we're talking about is, is directions. Ezra wants to triple the size of the tar sands. I would like to phase them out. Neither one of these things can be done tomorrow. Ezra could no sooner triple the size of the tar sands than I could phase them out tomorrow. Uh, but we could make a decision about how the next hundred billion dollars of infrastructure money is spent, and one route takes us in a very positive direction, and the other one leads us in a very negative direction. <laughs> I got a time limit here, guys. At the end of the day, Ezra's book is a sales pitch. It's not a book on ethics. It's not a book on science. It's not a book written by an environmentalist, a scientist, an energy analyst. It's a sales pitch for a free market agenda. And, uh, you know, really to take this book seriously, even just looking at the title, uh, let's talk about oil. Even without talking about climate change, oil is, one of, is the number one source of carcinogens, benzene, and all kinds of other nasty toxins uh, that we face in, in modern industrial society. Uh, you know, our automobiles are basically the equivalent of living with a smoker. Uh, now, I know that Ezra doesn't think secondhand smoke's a problem, but 
if you did con you know, concern yourself with such things as exposure to toxins, you know, there, this is one of the major sources of toxins that we face in the world. Why didn't you name your book Ethical Benzene? Or Ethical Carcinogens? Or The Best Place on Earth to Get Cancer? Of course, unless you can't afford public health care. So, ultimately, I think there's a fundamental flaw in Ezra's logic. Um, and, you know, and I, I say this with all due respect, but I think, you know, if you, if you look at the world in his book, which he claims has four liberal criteria, uh, one of which is the environment. If you look at the environment as simply a value, uh, you know, you're really missing the point. Because the environment is a location. It's where we are. It's where we live. It's what we interact with. It's where our oxygen comes from, how our food is grown. You know, the environment is not simply a value. It is a location. Um, and it's a location that connects all of us. Ecology and an understanding of ecology connects all of us to one another and ourselves to the planet. And if you believe that this is about every man for himself and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, you don't believe any set of values that connects you to anybody else. So at the end of the day, I think the fundamental flaw in Ezra's logic is that he's coming from a place, and I think the whole free market movement is ultimately coming from a place, of ecological illiteracy. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, I think all of us are to a certain extent, but you know, there's certain trajectories that would add us further down that road, or there's ways that we could try to address that. Uh, so fundamentally, I believe that Ezra's book is, is not ethical. I believe it's a sales pitch that's trying to be something else, and I think we have a responsibility to have this conversation with our friends and neighbors, and that's why I've invited Ezra here to be part of this discussion, because I do think it's a very important discussion. We as Canadians will decide the future of the Athabasca tar sands, and we can have a really, really big impact on whether we you know, play a positive role in the world or where we, whether we profit from making things a lot worse. So thank you all very much.